So I think some addictions are about, I need a high, I need an avoidance. So what you're asking yourself is, what is the unmet need that that experience is, is, is meeting? So there's always a function to it. I could not point the feelings, but there was a lot of emotion feelings inside of me. So I felt like a, an explosion, a bomb who's, who's going to explode somehow. First time that I, I tried the drugs and it, it went very clearly for me, I felt like, oh shit, now I'm home. I cannot feel those feelings anymore. All those mad feelings that I was carrying on uh, in my life, I could now throw them away. I experimented with MDMA. I was 16. It felt almost like like falling in love. I just kind of lost um, lost uh, any positive view on life. I had lust to give up. I just felt that I had to. Also felt that also, maybe that virusen would lose some of the the that I had got I had got grip of. The feeling of Ecstasy when it leaves you is is like hatred. Like uh, I was hating myself. It was like um, I was the loneliest person in the world. I felt it for very much for shame and shame. And how do I get to clear up to myself? And Mamma, she was actually sick for one year because of me. And I knew it. I was Rusa. But I got totally. Du, du säljer själva det till det var. Jag har ju dratt så mycket upp i näsa. Jag följde mig inte bra och jag tydde till någon som jag trodde skulle följa mig bra. Och då så jag andra folk som jag älskar och bryr mig om och ser att de blir rädda och ledsa och triste och bekymrade för mig. Så följde väl jag att Vad var er grunden till att jag är er Jag känner mig inte som en dritt. Jag bara sårar familjen och folk. Så Så when I started with um, alcohol work in the main and then there was a little bit of drug work. You know, fundamentally there was always a rationale to it. You know, I learned that I was not very assertive, so I used to drink to, you know, not get involved with feeling so pissed off that people were treating me badly. Or I was quite an anxious person, or particularly around social anxiety, so I knew if I had a drink, I'd relax and I could cope with it. And before you know it, it's got a grip, hasn't it? Say about the drugs, I need to just get out of my head. Why do you need to get out of your head? Because I can't cope with what else is there. So it's getting under, there's always a logic and a rationality to it. For me, it was dealing with um, body image. Being in the fitness industry, I'd created this belief that I had to look a certain way. I saw myself as bad as take the fifth pound. You see it as a misfortune. You are a misfortune. And I saw so many dumb things to myself that I had to get out of the dark hole. The only thing I knew that took away all the bad feelings was heroin. Jeg tror, sådan ligesom det er med mange folk, der er inde i misbrug, så er det noget, du bliver langsomt trukket ind i. Altså, det er sådan noget med, at grænserne øh, konstant rykker sig, fordi du ikke er opmærksom på, at de gør det. Øhm, så du, du ser ikke, at du langsomt øh, faktisk bliver afhængig af et stof eller alkohol. Du bliver ligesom lullet ind i det igennem en årrække, øh, og som oftest er det tæt forbundet til, at du ikke får behandlet nogle af de ting, der er under overfladen. For mig startede det ligesom mange andre, tror jeg, med rigtig meget alkohol i gymnasietiden. Jeg brugte mere tid i festudvalget, end jeg går på at gå i skole, fordi jeg synes, det var sjovt at lave fester og sådan. Så jeg har altid også bare elsket det der naturligt, fordi det var ligesom en god flugt for mig og en måde at være til på. Ultimately, it's one coping strategy. If people choose that coping strategy, as long as they're making an informed choice, i.e. this comes with a very high cost, physically, socially, financially, psychologically, you know, you, you help people weigh up the pros and cons of that. Do you want to pay the price of this? So is there another way of getting the need met that doesn't come with the price tag of alcohol or the price tag of drugs? Yeah, but they have to want to make that change. I was friend with with one lady. This lady, uh, I think she was interested on in me or something, 
but I was using drugs and my life was not so uh, so uh, so good. Uh, I didn't even like myself in that time. Um, I was I, I had I had a bad, bad feeling about myself. So so how could how could I love somebody else? It didn't exist for me. I didn't even accept myself as a human being. So I saw myself as a, as like somebody who's just who just exist for existing. I think I tried all the chemicals you can try. I think I I tried it over and over again and then at uh, one point uh, nothing helped anymore. I was doing it doesn't matter what I was doing. Uh, the the feeling was still there. Uh, det å føle seg som ikke en dritt da. Og så ty til narkotika for å prøve å føle seg bedre og få det bedre. For å se at man såre venner og, eller de venner jeg hadde. Og familie. Mamma kom gråtende på døra mange ganger for loven men Hun gråt vel mer enn hun lo i den perioden. Jeg er opvokset hos en alkoholiseret mor, som har gjort, at jeg i en meget, meget tidlig alder skulle være voksen og skulle sørge for mig selv, øh, og faktisk også sørge for hende, øh, hvor at hun ikke var i stand til at give mig omsorg. Hun var ikke i stand til at anerkende mig, øh, respektere mig og, og give det, som et barn egentlig skal have. Jeg remember <coughs> being angry and upset because I had polluted blood in me. I remember a moment when he woke me up in the middle of the night and I was sleeping downstairs in the first floor. He woke me up, he was drunk, uh, but like, just like a little bit too drunk. And then he took me up into the kitchen. I was sitting there and he, I remember I was just looking at him, he was just yabbering. I was a pretty smart kid, pretty reflected, and I had to grow up quite quickly. So I just remember looking at him and being disappointed. I'm like, what do you want? Every time I saw him like that, I thought about him. But I thought about my mom always. Like, how are you putting mom through this? Coming home like that, talking about this, trying to do that, trying to do this. Like, it's, uh, at one point he came home and he wanted to take my dog away. He just needed money for something that day. And he just came out and just started making a ruckus at home, talking, asking my mom about this. I was like, leave me the fuck alone. Stop coming here, asking for money for whatever. Stuff like that that made it difficult for me like to approach him on another level because it was always about some crazy shit back then. But yeah, it made me feel helpless. At the end, maybe careless. He was a active uh, gang member. Uh, he's spent most of his life in jail in and out of jails, and also with drugs. Um, along the years, probably just think about coping the pain, but all of that just made me sometimes feel like I have to be the big brother for my big brother. And that that just made our relationship difficult. And uh, we had a lot of unsaid things between us. So at the time he passed away, I was kind of mad and sad. There's a, a model of change called the trans-theoretical model of change, but really what you call it is, is the stages of change. And it helps people think about where they're at in terms of making the decision to change their lives. So the first stage is what you call pre-contemplator. I'm oblivious to the fact this is causing me any problems in my life. So there's no point talking to people about changing their alcohol because they don't think they've got a problem. So there are particular interventions you can do to help them move into what you call contemplation. Contemplation, I know it's causing difficulties, but I'm not sure I want to make a change yet. You need to give people the space to look at the advantages of drinking, and there will be some, because people aren't stupid, you know, they'll be getting something out of it. And the costs of that, um, the disadvantages of stopping drinking, because there will be some, so it, that's where you often find out the functionality. Well, actually, if I stop drinking, I don't know how to be with people. Ha. So, and then the why now, you know, in the contemplation phase, the why now, why would you want to make a change now? And then people move into action. 
and actually be quite a short stage because you start acting quite quickly and quite quickly you then move into maintenance. So how do I maintain the change that I've just made? I took a dose of heroin, pills, cocaine and amphetamine and one of the same spray and sat in the air and tracked in, pumped in. Og på grund av den rusen der, så fick jeg en, en oppvåkning. Da. Den rusen var så kraftig at jeg slo hodet i veggen. Og tenkte, hvorfor gidder jeg straffruse meg på den måten her? Hvorfor gjør jeg det? Og jeg ringte opp tilbake til behandlingshjemmet og spurte om jeg kunne komme opp dit igjen. Jeg dro opp dit dagen etter og hadde ruset meg så sinnssykt hardt på toget at da jeg kom inn i behandlingshjemmet så fikk jeg noen no beroligende tabletter. Da. Og da sov jeg i to døgn. Og da jeg våkna opp da, da hadde ikke kroppen fått i seg rus på 48 timer. Og kroppen skrek etter rus. Og det gjorde så vondt i kroppen min. Jeg har hatt mange forskjellige abstinenser. Men abstinensen her, den var helt jævlig. Og da sa jeg til meg selv, vet du hva? Det her skal jeg aldri oppleve. The first lesson, I suppose, is to give somebody the space to really think about what what this particular behavior is actually doing for them in a truly open, curious way. So often people maintain that they're listening for the function, but they, you, know, this, you can hear the judgment in it. You can hear that I'm only listening to then get you to change. No, you've got to be totally neutral. And you've got to help people explore the advantages of drinking for them. And there will be plenty. You listen out for the difference between I need to change this to I want to change this. Yeah? So you give people that space to be ambivalent. Once they're ambivalent, they can be more honest. Once they can be more honest, you can really get the advantages of drinking. What I am going to lose by stopping drinking. That's the biggest issue. Then you allow people to take that risk together because they've been straight with you. My message to anybody, whether it be an abusive relationship, drug addiction, alcoholism, change is possible. I thought I was written off. 15 years ago, I thought there was no hope. And I sit here now with a positive mindset, clear of any drug-related medications, clean from drugs, away from an abusive relationship and living a, as normal as normal can be, happy life. So I just want to say to you that it is possible and you will come out of it feeling 110 times better. You know when you take drugs and you feel like good, like a good day, like that's that's the feeling you will have all the time. You won't feel the, the the highest peaks, you know, but you won't for sure feel the lowest fucking pain there is in the world. So if you want to have a nice life that's beautiful, fun, uh, and all in between, uh, go and seek help. Yeah, ja, det kan ta tid. Det gjorde det i mitt tilfelle. Men når bakken har gått ned og treffer bånd, så går den upp. Det er en lang process, og det er mange forskjellige måter man kan söka hjälp på. Min måte var jo å finne en glede i å være nytte. Først og fremst synes jeg at du skal tilgi dig selv for at begå alle de fejl som du gør, fordi en del af det at vokse som menneske er, at vi skal fejle en hel masse. Øhm, det vigtigste, du kan gøre for dig selv, er ikke at lade de fejl ødelægge dig, men lade dem styrke dig som menneske. Øhm, du kan enten vælge at lade dem definere dig, eller du kan lære, og, eller du kan tale, lære af dem og, og, og forstå dem og acceptere dem som en del af din historie og handle på dem. Uh, for this, they are really important for who come here. All people have a different journey. Uh, I don't think it's it's done in one day. All people stumble all the time. It's important not to beat yourself down on it. You know, I think uh, that's very normal. Uh, so you need to give yourself a break and to take. It takes time, you know, and try to 
to get to terms with like like for addiction it's not something that is fixed or cured like overnight you know it takes time uh, and it i i i see it so often as a relational problem it is uh, a problem of connecting to other people and to connecting to your own feelings uh, you know so but connecting to people takes time and accepting your feelings take time you know but you can't do it alone you do it with other people if you have this addiction this obsession that isn't serving you well then you please 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 speak to somebody about it it's absolutely important 